I'm Mike, and today, by popular request, we're going to look at the article The Case Against Veganism by Mercola, which is essentially his interview with ex-vegetarian Mara Khan on her new book, The Vegan Betrayal. We're going to dispel the blatantly dishonest claims they make against veganism from how vegans are lacking mysterious nutrients that are yet to be discovered to how the low protein nature of a vegan diet leads to muscle wasting. Now I'm kind of late to this party because I was planning on leaving this alone. Her book has like 20 reviews on Amazon so I figured it's not widely read, it's not a big deal. But with all the quests from you guys and the 8,000 plus shares the article from Mercola has on Facebook, I figured I should touch on it. And there are some things that I haven't talked about in there. So let's get right to their claims. The first and quite astounding one is that veganism isn't well studied. There are simply too many uh, unknowns and too many unstudied people, too little research to make any kind of definitive conclusion that veganism is healthy and uh, prevents disease. Don't worry, I will be speeding her up. And that's her angle, that veganism just doesn't have enough research. But it's not the 70s anymore. Seriously, there is so much data on long-term vegans. So much so that now the president of the American College of Cardiology is not just vegan, but tells people to go vegan. And even Denise Minger, who famously debunked the China study, quote-unquote, is even giving presentations highlighting the research of the benefits of a vegan diet. Throughout the video, Mercola is constantly applauding Khan for her researching abilities, but how does such an amazing researcher miss studies like this by Dr. Esselstyn, showing how a whole food plant-based diet clinically reverses heart disease our leading killer, showing a 100 times lower incidence of heart disease and stroke for those that stuck with the diet compared to those that did not. And the multiple large-scale population studies observing a 47 to 78% less type 2 diabetes rate among vegans and a 60 to 75% lower high blood pressure rate among vegans and lower cancer rates. Okay, now to her next claim, one of her main claims. Veganism is a non-historical diet and that's one of the main points I make in the book. Its health benefits are not verified. This is an appeal to history fallacy, that because we weren't vegan throughout history, it shouldn't be done, but there are countless things that aren't validated by history that we should not stop. We have large-scale water treatment, planes, trains, cars, electricity, the internet, and countless other things that affect our body, perhaps, and that doesn't mean that we should stop them. What I'm trying to say is, hand over your webcam, Mrs. Khan, because you're joining the Amish. But what she's trying to convey here really is that you should be scared of veganism because not enough people have done it. In reality, this is just not true, not just because of all the long-term population studies I mentioned earlier, but just because of the sheer amount of people that are vegan today on planet Earth. The population of vegans in the US is about the same size as Native Americans before white people genocidally decimated them. This is millions of people that we were talking about and they are looked at under a microscope. If there is one instance of malnutrition, it makes headlines in the news. And not to get too anecdotal on you, but we have people like Ellsworth Wareham who has been vegan for 50 years and worked into his late 90s as a heart surgeon and even mowed his lawn at like 100 years old. And there are tons of healthy adults that have been vegan their entire life. Finally, there are plenty of things that have stood the test of time that are harmful for us, like drinking alcohol, and animal products can be put in that category. So what we did or didn't do in history is often a poor compass to work from, and unlike the people who lived in times where scarcity was the norm, we are not starving. We have the choice to not eat animals and their byproducts. Moving on, of course, this would not be a proper vegan roast without mentioning nutrients. And it became very, very clear all the missing what are called carny nutrients mm -hmm. that are uh, in animals that are not in plants. That nutrition science is still in its infancy. Mm -hmm. uh, researchers are still discovering nutri new nutrients, and uh, including nutrients that are found only in animals. And they will continue to discover them. But her approach here is a little different. It's essentially that vegans are probably deficient in mystical yet scientific nutrients that have yet to be discovered. Maybe you're sufficiently scared by this idea of future nutrients, but I'm not, especially because one of the most rapidly developing areas of nutritional science is that of the microbiome or our gut flora, and it's only making the case for a vegan diet stronger and eating meat weaker. Researchers are finding that after eating meat, your gut flora quickly and dramatically takes a turn for the worst. And from this study a couple years ago, the vegan gut microbiome is being defined as having less pathogenic species, more protective species, and less inflammation. 
As if future nutrients weren't enough, she also brings up some non-essential nutrients like carnosine and taurine, which are arguments I really haven't heard in a long time because it's widely accepted that our body makes enough of both of these. But this got Dr. Mercola talking about DHA, how plants don't actually have enough precursors for you to convert, and how algae supplements, well, here he is. A lot of the vegetarians or vegans will say, well, we can get our DHA from uh, marine algae. And yes, it's DHA, but I don't think it's the same thing. It's just not integrated into the food. He goes on to just assume that there are no studies on this. And this is what I don't appreciate about Dr. Mercola. He just gets these convenient feelings that have no basis in science. But the reality is DHA is DHA, fish get it from algae, and newsflash studies show that taking algae-based DHA raises blood levels of DHA in vegans. Mercola also claims the ALA to DHA conversion rate is down below 1% by citing a low-carb blog, which is the only source he cited in the actual article. But ones actually seen in the literature are 2 to 5% or closer to 4%. And that means that you can eat three ounces of walnuts and make all the DHA that you need. It's also important to note that non-fish eaters develop a more efficient conversion of ALA to DHA as this study shows. And the longest living population ever studied, the Adventist vegetarians, about 20% of which were vegan, did not eat fish. That being said, algae-based DHA supplements are a proven insurance policy that allows you to just not have to worry about omegas and not risk eating cholesterol and heavy metal-laden fish. And they really are obsessed with fish in this video. Yes, I eat plentiful sardines. I mean, I eat sardines like every other day. And the rush of, of powerful energy I get from them, I cannot find anywhere in the plant. Does she understand energy? Sardines just don't break the law of thermodynamics and allow you to extract more calories from them than plant sources. Maybe she should have a talk about energy with ultramarathoner Scott Jurek, who is vegan and holds the U.S. record for the longest distance run in 24 hours at over 165 miles. In the end, vegans can meet all of their specific nutritional needs quite easily. So the nutritional challenges of a vegan diet are quite easily overcome. An omnivorous diet, not so much, no matter how healthy you want it to be. Well, healthy eggs are another great source, too. I have those regularly. Oh. So, well, healthy eggs. But no matter what positive words you serve your eggs with, they still have the highest level of cholesterol second to brains. And studies like this show that they spike your cholesterol right after eating them. And other studies show that they increase the thickness of your arteries. The reality is there's no escaping the damage that an omnivorous diet does to your cardiovascular system, and cardiovascular diseases like heart attack and stroke are the most deadly of all of these nutritional issues we're talking about. Probably the best part of her whole interview is her anecdotal claims about a doctor she knows that sees a lot of vegetarians and vegans with muscle wasting. I talked to a metabolic expert, Dr. Diane Schwartz, and she has treated many vegetarians and vegans uh, with muscle wasting, and there are risks for too low proteins. You actually start um, consuming your, your own uh, muscles. So in that sense, vegans are consuming flesh. Here are some vegans with muscle wasting. There's Patrick Baboumian, who was Germany's strongest man in 2011. And then you have Kendrick Ferris, who was the only male weightlifter on Team USA to make it to the Rio Olympics, and countless others. And believe it or not, I have gained weight and strength on a vegan diet. I mean, look at these nails. No protein deficiency here. These are actually dangerous. They're too strong. In all seriousness, there's no scientific data behind her muscle wasting claims. Muscle wasting is a starvation issue, and those that chose to starve themselves using a vegan diet are not representative of veganism. And here is another study that Khan did not find in her research, which ironically shows that vegans have better blood protein levels than omnivores, likely due to the decreased level of inflammation, since inflammation blocks protein creation in the liver. And now for the ethical gymnastics you've been waiting for. Quote from my book, there's no animal free lunch. Um, animals are destroyed in industrial agriculture. And so what the scientists found is that a lot of small mammals um, and rodents are getting killed in these fields and it was the estimates are pretty high actually up to like 70 percent so we should all just throw our hands up and elect to kill even more animals in a logical sense this is literally the same as saying i might accidentally kill a pedestrian with my car so it's okay to consciously choose to kill people 
If you actually care about field harvesting deaths, you should be aware that nearly 40% of the grain grown on Earth is fed to animals, and you should become familiar with this chart. This is the animal death rate per million calories of various foods, and extra grain harvesting deaths from animal feed on an omnivorous diet alone is reason enough to be vegan. Then add the animals you kill to eat on top of that. So vegan is better, and the goal is to be better, not perfect. I need to know personally, why do I need to eat animal food when I don't want to? I don't want to. At this point, I think it becomes clear why this woman spent six years writing a book about why veganism sucks, because she felt guilty and needed to find a way to feel good about her bad habits. To sum it all up, I think Robert Grillo from Free From Harm did a pretty good job of the ethical angle on his Amazon review with, quote, Vegan fear-mongering is a great strategy to sell books. The non-vegan majority is salivating over books like this, which become the pretext for decreeing, See? Now I know why I'm not vegan. The ultimate betrayal, of course, ironically being our treatment of animals. And from a health perspective, a default vegan diet will put you in a better health state than your old diet, as these long-term population studies have shown. And with a little focus on eating a balanced diet, you can achieve the unachievable, as these clinical studies have shown. All right, feel free to like and subscribe to not miss my next video, which will be on vegan athletes. All right, thanks for watching and see you then.